Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome, uh, Professor Katz, uh, who is joining us from North Wales. Is that correct? North Wales. Yes. Okay, so first of all, I want to acknowledge that we're on the lands of the Bunurung people of the Kulin Nation and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, so some of us are on the, these lands, obviously not uh, David Katz, who is in North Wales. Um, David, who's normally based in Vilnius, but beaming in today from Wales, is a Yiddish and Holocaust scholar and professor at Vilnius Gediminus Technical University. You can correct my pronunciation uh, on that one. He edits the web journal Defending History and is at work on a new Yiddish cultural dictionary. I first came across David when I saw the film Rewriting History made in uh, about 2012 by local academic and filmmaker Danny Ben Moshe, who in the film joined uh, Professor David Katz as they took on the Lithuanian government to try and prevent an inconvenient World War II historical truth from being obliterated by rewriting history, the history of the Holocaust. The film opened up my eyes and many others here to the concept of the double genocide that was going on in Eastern Europe, a most perverse, for, perverse form of Holocaust distortion. Uh, David, in fact, presented two lectures in Melbourne around that time, uh, which we recently re-aired during lockdown as part of our From the Vault series. So last year, when we could travel um, all the way back in 2019, I made a whirlwind tour of Latvia, Lithuania and Hungary, three countries at the heart of Holocaust revisionism principally because the people who committed the atrocities against Jews in those countries are actually revered heroes locally. This was a most challenging and eye-opening trip. In each of those places, I encountered the decaying beauty of past glory, walking the streets of Riga, Kovno and Vilna with their subtle charms was truly pleasant. But to enjoy it, one, one must completely switch off the cognitive part of the brain, the part where knowledge sits. Additionally, in each place I visited, um, I visited sites of unimaginable atrocities, particularly the Panari Forest outside of Vilna and the Ninth Fort Museum um, outside of Kovno. And to be clear, these were atrocities committed against Jews by, mostly by the locals, not by the Nazis. In Riga, uh, I made a personal pilgrimage to the Ghetto Museum where its director, Rabbi Menachem Barkahan, showed me around. The museum is outside uh, the Riga Old Town, which is a place of um, indescribable beauty and charm. I spent two idyllic days there in the Old Town, recovering from jet lag after a very long trip from Melbourne with uh, numerous stops. So I switched off my brain, uh, which was quite jet lagged, and, and I pretended the Holocaust never happened and enjoyed the sights and the wine bars and and particularly an underground tavern that I discovered in Riga. But then I, I came to and I summoned up the energy to leave the old town, walk through the bustling market on the edge of town and head into a grimy old industrial area. And that's where the ghetto had once been. Um, and in this kind of unappealing part of town, Rabbi Barkahan has attempted to re reclaim history by establishing a sprawling indoor outdoor museum with galleries in some of the old buildings. It's fascinating, informative, and many of the displays are very arty and creative. But the central feature for me was the large, uh, seemingly unending wall of names. On one side, the local Jew names of the local Jewish people who were murdered, and on the other side were the Jews from Western Europe who were mostly had been deported from their homes in Germany, and Austria sent to Riga to work as slaves and then murdered. My great grandmother in her sixties at the time was amongst these Jews. She came from Kassel in Germany. Menachem helped me find her name, Emma Heiser and provided me with a candle which we lit together and said a, a memorial prayer. Her name is one among 70 odd thousand on that wall. 
So I'll now invite David to provide us with an update on what's going on in terms of Holocaust memory in these parts of Europe. And perhaps he can start with an update on recent events in relation to the Riga Ghetto Museum and attempts to shut that museum down in a kind of underhanded way. So uh, let's welcome um, Professor Katz. Good evening in Melbourne and good morning in Europe and good in the middle of the day in North America. Thank you, Jane, for those kind and important words. I'm very honored to be with you again. I had the pleasure and honor in 2011 of speaking at the Jewish Holocaust Center in Melbourne. I applaud you for your open-mindedness and welcome a diversity of views. Some of the views I'm going to express today uh, would not be very welcome at, at some of the major international Holocaust uh, museums and centers and academic study programs, not necessarily because anyone disagrees, but because it's thought in politically not nice, not proper to bring up these matters. There's a hope that they'll just add. Um, I also want to thank personally the people in Melbourne who made my 2011 trip possible and have supported us all these years. I won't mention them all. I'll mention my fellow Vilna uh, comrade and, and friend Philip Meisel, um, who as the, uh, has a survivor with a keen sense of education and love of young people has been able to convey so much. And as Jane mentioned, I want to acknowledge Danny Ben Moshe, whose film took our work in Vilnius uh, to the far corners of the world. So thank you, thank you all. Well, um, I do have a PowerPoint today and I'm um, not one of those uh, technical uh, little things. So let's see if we can get it going with share screen. As you see, our title is Writing the Holocaust Out of History. Now that sounds extreme, but I'm going to argue that that is exactly what is happening. Now, the Holocaust, before we even get to anything controversial, has two very distinct meanings, and we have to be clear about them. The first is the facts of what happened, the sum total of people indeed killed for having been born Jewish by Hitler's forces and collaborators during World War II. That is notion number one of the Holocaust. Notion number two is a historic concept of a unique genocide that is conceptually and empirically distinct from other momentous and numerically larger mass murders, both in the mid 20th century and throughout history and morally and ethical, not of the same category. To put it simply, when a state decides to send its armies to uh, a whole bunch of countries to destroy, to murder every man, woman, and child of a certain nation, ethnicity, group, religion, and succeeds in rendering all those countries free or near free of the previous civilization, then that is genocide in one of the classic senses of genocide. The word genocide is itself controversial, and at this stage, I'll stick to the point that it is different. There may be six million, maybe fewer than the tens of millions who perished altogether in World War II. Six million, maybe fewer than the larger number that perished in Soviet gulag or because of Soviet crimes during the roughly 70 years of Soviet history of the Soviet Union, but it's very different. I'll just mention one aspect of genocide to give an example of difference. <clears throat> in the Middle Ages, when the uh, Crusades murdered so many people for not agreeing to be baptized, one could save oneself as many did by saying, yes, I'll be baptized. I want to be a Christian. Finished. You're not going to be killed anymore. You saved yourself. In genocide, there's nothing you can do. You're being murdered for the way you are being born. 
It doesn't matter if you're a man, a woman, a child, an old person, nothing you can do can change it. It's a unique situation. Now, the classic term Holocaust denial usually refers strictly to that first definition. 20th, 20th century Holocaust denial was about definition one. And 20th century denial was indeed about saying it didn't happen. The gas chambers are either a myth or they are uh, vastly exaggerated. Um, if we need to take an event as a symbolic close of an era, it would perhaps be that famous court case in the year 2000 when Holocaust um, um, denier David Irving brought libel charges against historian Deborah Lipstadt for having called him a Holocaust denier. And Mr. Justice Charles Gray, in fact, Sir Charles, as he's known more often uh, in London, in his 349-page verdict in April of that year, brought to an end somehow the, the power of classic Holocaust denial in elite, in polite, in mainstream Western society, driving it further into the fringes. Roughly the same time, the second kind of denial was beginning to take shape and is now in full bloom. Now, a whole bunch of historic events, some of which are far too intricate to get into, but I'll be delighted to the best of my ability to answer your, your questions and comments. Let's start with around 1989, 1991, 90, and so on. The Soviet Union collapses, and there's the rise of the new European Union and NATO states. In other words, the states that since then have become members of the European Union and NATO. And this brings me to an important point. These states, generally speaking, are democracies. Uh, you can test democracy many ways. One of the best ways is to see if there's a pendulum in the elections every so often, every few years, one party, then another party. Then you know you have some kind of democracy. These countries generally pass the test with flying colors. They have developed robust democracies in many cases. There has now been some backsliding in Hungary and Poland as you will know from the media, but compared to the states to the east of a certain line, the whole area is democratic and is, isn't, it's watched by the European Union and NATO. Now, I'd like to make a personal comment. I've been living in Vilnius, Lithuania for 21 years uh, because of the uh, pandemic, or as, as we call it in Yiddish, die Magefe or die Cholere, I find myself in North Wales, in beautiful North Wales, uh, this winter. I want to say that in my 21 years living in Lithuania, I have been treated exceptionally well. My neighbors in Vilnius are not Holocaust deniers. They don't think that uh, there's anything uh, wrong about different opinions about the war. The problem we have in Eastern Europe isn't with the long-suffering, underpaid, hardworking men and women of Eastern Europe. It's what the diplomatic community calls the elites. The elites are the politicians, mainstream political parties, the media, um, parts of the arts, um, and, and other elites. But the, the politics and academia are the two uh, main power bases. Now, it may strike outsiders as very strange that in Lithuania, you can, um, or indeed in Latvia, in Estonia, you can stand outside the president's residence and call the president the worst names in the world, and you will not be arrested because it's a democracy. But if you dare challenge the narrative of history that is being established, you are very likely to lose your employment become a persona non grata, um, and on paper be liable to prosecution uh, because these countries have indeed passed laws 
uh, forbidding the opinion that there was only one genocide, that of the Nazis and their collaborators. Um, the state history says there were two equal genocides by the Nazis and the Soviet Union, by the Soviet Union and their Jewish friends, first as the narrative goes, and then by the Nazis. So a number of these countries have laws that say that anyone who would trivialize, disagree with one of the two genocides is liable. We will come soon to the different years in prison you can get uh, for those opinions. Now, the plot thickens, as they say. Point number three, Russia, especially since 1999, 2000, and the Putin regime, has been sliding into dictatorship revenges and being a danger to its democratic neighbors on all sides. And this has fed into both a need and an ability to get away with history revisionism with using the argument that this is a wonderful stick to hit Putin with. Just think about it. If the Nazis and Soviets committed equal genocide, well now, Germany spent half a century as some kind of pariah, atoning for its sins, admitting the truth. And Putin, head of the successor state, the Russian Federation of the Soviet Union, did no such thing. So genocide, the idea that the Soviets are as guilty as the Nazis, or that they are also committers of genocide, gives a, a new stick to demands for reparations, demands for apologies, and indeed for um, the history and informational wars. Um, finally, we have ultranationalism. I, I, I've put ultra in, in parentheses, in brackets, uh, because there are different opinions on where nationalism ends and ultranationalism starts, or where center-right ends in politics and far-right starts. I will argue that anybody who glorifies Holocaust collaborators who participated or helped or abetted the murder of these countries, Jewish uh, um, civilian helpless Jewish minorities is both ultranationalist and far right, even if we're not talking about skinheads. We're talking about professors of law, journalists, academics, experts in Jewish history, Hebrew, Yiddish, whatever, um, who uh, tend to um, who, who tend to know a lot about Jewish history uh, and and do a lot in the way of PR with foreign Jews. Um, so these are a little bit of the complexities of the region, and this was strongest in the following in the countries that share these characteristics. One where there was massive, directly lethal collaboration, which is much of Eastern Europe in the sense of being the murderers um, under German rule and in several, in a number of countries before the Germans actually got there. So it's a very different kind of Holocaust collaboration than in Western countries where collaboration meant going to the Gestapo and ratting on a Jew hiding in the attic so that that Jew would be deported somewhere to where they were all being deported to, not to defend that kind of horrific betrayal of neighbor. It's just very different than providing massive number of actual people. Two, these are countries where the Nazi forces were usually welcomed as great liberators, liberators from this uh, Soviet occupation. And Traces of more than traces. It's a version that you find in standard works, books, and treatments today. Okay? That the Nazis freed our people from the Soviet yoke. Ah, yes, there were some sad problems about some of the minorities. Uh, and then the ultranationalists perhaps won't tell you, but we were, they would say to each other or to me over, uh, over a drink, we finally got our ethnically pure country. Uh, we have our own country. We got our country back in that whole kind of system. Finally, three, in a way, this is the most important, where the current elites in government, academia, whom I mentioned, they are building their national history, what the textbooks say, what the museums say, what the brochures say, um, and they're exporting it 
with a heroic narrative of World War II of anti-Soviet glory. Now, in countries like Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, where not a shot was fired um, in 1940 when they were made Soviet republics with fake elections, and roughly a year later, after June 22nd, 23rd, 1941, their forces started murdering uh, Jews, that history is being covered up by saying that the second act, 1941, was really a heroic revolt against the Soviet forces there. Now, that is total nonsense. You can rebel against someone in power. You cannot rebel against someone running away for their life from someone else. On June 22nd, 23rd, 1941, the Soviet army collapsed in all these countries and fled from Operation Barbarossa, Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union, the largest invasion of human history. The Soviets were fleeing from Hitler's invasion, from the Luftwaffe's bombing, from the, the, the huge number of, of arriving forces. They, just, they were not fleeing from the Jew shooters of the local nationalists who put on white armbands and are today extolled in the center of these cities in, in beautiful museums, often partly paid for by the European Union as being great freedom fighters who drove out the Soviet army. Now, all of this, all of this revisionism, these feelings, these rewritings, um, they have fed into not literal denial of that definition one, but denial of definition two. So yes, yes, Holocaust happened, just as Holodomor happened in Ukraine. They found a word that had eight letters in the first four, which were H-O-L-O, -O, um, uh, for the Ukrainian tragedy, the famine of the early 1930s, early and mid-1930s. The Holocaust may have nine letters, but it's close enough. There is a kind of Holocaust envy. There are many fascinating aspects. But the idea was to reduce the Holocaust to one of many things and far from the word. There have been different words. The great uh, scholar Michael Schaffer in Romania has been the pioneer of this academic field. His papers, almost all available in English, they trace this from the 1990s. He often calls it Holocaust negationism. Another fine scholar, uh, Esther Goldberg Gilbert, the wife of the late Sir Martin Gilbert, has called it downgrade in her uh, terrific article about Lithuania. Ephraim Zurov of the Wiesenthal Center has called it Holocaust distortion and uh, from the moment I got involved in this in 2008, events that I'll be uh, telling you about, uh, I called it obfuscation because that's how I felt about it before I got involved. During the 11 years, I was a simple, happy Yiddish professor, loved by the authority. Okay, so in those years, I saw that the Holocaust was being obfuscated at every turn. Here, there is something worse that happened. Here there was something wrong with the victim. Here this, here that. Um, a number of Israeli scholars and others from the 90s uh, used the word symmetry. The late Dov Levin, for example. I don't know who coined it for this purpose and who used it first. Uh, symmetry of Nazi and Soviet crime. By the early 21st century, it was growing into a new model, a paradigm with textbooks, conferences, declarations, and that has become known as double genocide. And the key territory that double genociders want to uh, conquer is the European Parliament, which can be quite easy to conquer. <laughs> Most people are looking the other way. But also, frankly, Jewish and other visitors from America, Israel, uh, Britain, and, and the rest of the world who are given the false narrative, but they're given the false narrative together with magnificent memorials for the Jews, with sometimes with medals and citations 
photo op with kings, uh, queens, princes, prime ministers. Um, so this double genocide is being pursued by a number of countries, but by little Lithuania more successfully, more adroitly, more cunningly than any. Of course, in the European Parliament, you can't walk around saying double genocide. You have to have a wonderful name in Eurospeak. And in Eurospeak, it's the equal evaluation of totalitarian regimes. As my late mother would have said, I wish I had a penny for every time I've heard that phrase or something very close to it. That this is all about equality, equal evaluation of evil. We're all the same. In other words, anybody who believes that the Holocaust was something worse or distinct or empirically different is some kind of very parochial, probably Jewish fanatic, or probably a stooge of Putin and a, a secret admirer of the Soviet Union. Now, the countries involved are the Baltics, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. Ukraine, that is not a member or not yet a member of the European Union and NATO. Within Ukraine, these are the views of Western Ukraine, but now, of course, of much of the central government in Kiev. And with various differences in Romania, Croatia, and Hungary, if, the, if these countries come up in questions, we can say a little more because the history was different in these places. But the common denominator uh, is massive participation in killing one way or another be it by bullets uh, in the Baltics and Ukraine and concentration camps elsewhere, um, welcoming the Nazis and considering um, the local collaborators to, to this day to be great heroes worthy of statues alongside the statues commemorating the Holocaust for the benefit of, of, of Western. Um, Lithuania is more than a laboratory. Lithuania is the epitome of this movement for a whole bunch of reasons. Of the larger communities in Europe, Lithuania had the highest proportion of Holocaust victims among its Jewish population, 96.4% or 96% around that figure of Lithuanian Jewry was annihilated in the Holocaust. Um, the fine historian Dina Porat has a famous paper where she calculates all the different ways and shows how you come to 96% or thereabouts, no matter. Secondly, there's the shock factor. This was a country that for 600 years, in different guises, of course, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania in medieval Europe, then the Grand Duchy of Lithuania within the Polish-Lithuanian Union, after the Union of Lublin and the uh, interwar 20th century period, the Republic of Lithuania. But in all these incarnations, Lithuania had a splendid history of tolerance. To give one medieval faith, the most famous example, when Western Christian Europe was sinking in intolerance in the Crusades and its aftermath, the Grand Duke Vitold or Vitautas issued his incredible edict of 1388-1389, giving Jews amazing rights, rights to believe whatever they want, rights to own property, rights to the synagogue and cemetery in perpetuity. And it imposed what the Americans call affirmative action. Um, a Christian who didn't come to the aid of a Jew being attacked by another Christian could be fine. Of course, um, that was in the era when paganism, which is inherently more tolerant, multi-theism, was in power. But even in the interwar republics, Lithuania, like Latvia and Estonia, had an excellent record of tolerance, arguably the best in Eastern Europe. Of course, there was anti-Semitism that got worse in the 30s, but it's very hard or impossible to find instances of, of mortal anti-Jewish violence uh, in Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia in the interwar period. These were successful interwar republics before their destruction by the Soviet Union uh, by way of occupation, incorporation, and so forth, so forth. Um, th third, to make the contrast with earlier history 
even more extreme, more biting, more painful. In most of these countries, so-called local nationalist heroes committed mass murder uh, of, of, of Jewish neighbors before the actual arrival of Ger the first Germans and before the setting up of their administration. Thousands of Jews were murdered in Kaunas, Kovna, in the week of 22-23 June 1941, before German administration. Um, these were the uh, nationalists who put on white armbands and called themselves Lithuanian activists front LAF. And of course, as I earlier um, alluded to, these are the people um, glorified in museums and textbooks as having led the revolt that drove out uh, the Soviet Union. Um, now, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the rise of democracy, of course, made way for different narratives to arise. And we may complain that we don't like the one that, that, um, that arose and is becoming standard. My argument is, I'm no enemy of these countries. I love Lithuania. Nobody has forced me to spend 21 years there. Um, we have the right to come with our second opinion and to correct these ultranationalist distortions of this view. So, um, the Lithuania, uh, again, I'm going to bring my examples from Lithuania. It has managed to continue to rewrite Holocaust history while investing a lot of money in Jewish things. For example, today, you can catch it today, there's going to be a, um, a webinar um, honoring the 300th anniversary of the birth of the Gaon of Vilna. It's going to feature the best historians in Lithuania talking about Jewish history um, because 2020 was declared the year of the Gaon of Vilna. Never mind one of the people featured today is a famous law professor who's quietly in the vanguard of redefining genocide and getting the European Union to accept the, the inflated new definition. But getting to this uh, very East European business of naming the year, 2018 was named for a Holocaust collaborator who led one of those militias in the early weeks in 41 around the town of Druskenik in southeastern Lithuania. 2021, to start in a couple of weeks, is named for another Holocaust collaborator who uh, is accused by various witnesses uh, in writing of participation in those atrocities in Kaunas. In the Kaunas garage of that week, the Kaunas garage massacre, and in the beheading of Rabbi Zalman Ostovsky. In 2011, even the British Parliament passed an early day motion uh, 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 about that, that, that incident. So um, in, our, in our Jewish circles, we call it the, the classic sandwich, that the year of the Gaon of Vilna is being sandwiched between years uh, commemorating 1941 pillars. I have to say, various of these 1941 pillars were recycled in 44, 45, 46 as part of the post-war Forest Brothers opposition uh, militia against the um, uh, against Soviet rule. That is another issue, uh, but it's part of the same bigger issue that people who are anti-Soviet are honored, even if they have a lot of Jewish Holocaust blood on their hands. And having spent 30 years going to Lithuania uh, and the neighboring countries and 21 years living there, um, I can tell you one thing. All of the murderers were anti-Soviet. They prayed for a Nazi victory over the Soviet Union in the three years, 1941 to 44, or four years if you count 45, that the Soviet Union uh, was the major force in, in Eastern Europe, the only force fighting Hitler, that if that the events of 41 had not occurred, it's a very big question whether D-Day or a Western invasion ever would have occurred on the Western Front. Millions of Soviet soldiers uh, had to die. Moreover, 
every Jew that survived in the Baltics or Ukraine survived one way or another because of the Soviet Union, whose role in Jewish history from 1941 to 1945 is simply very different from its role in any other. Okay, um, Lithuania has a right-wing Jewish um, member of parliament who has been a member of parliament for almost all the three decades of independence. He's also a lover of Jewish and Litvak culture. He studied Yiddish in America. But what can he do? He's a politician. And when there's a Jewish fellow uh, who's brought to the European Parliament, it certainly helps things along. Um, if this will come up in questions, I'll have a, a memory or two. Right. Now, the campaign of equalization started in a big way in January 2008 with a small conference in Tallinn, Estonia, by European Parliament members. Uh, the Easterners were the, um, the active force, and of course there were a few Westerners to give it balance and legitimacy, and they declared that um, because of the lack of equal evaluation of the two large criminal regimes, millions of victims have been relegated to the category of second-rate victims, and the next sentence says never again must apply to them too, which indeed it may. Now, this business of equality of victimhood also sounds very beautiful. Let me tell you what's wrong with it. In a typical town today, in Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Ukraine, wherever you'll go, you'll find very many people, probably more, a growth in population in many places um, since the time of the war, but you won't find a single Jewish person because there's been a genocide and they were all killed. So the victimhood of the, let's say, in this uh, mythical town we're taking, that 4% of the town were sent to Siberia and some perished there, that's a terrible crime that needs to be studied. The crimes of communism are not known well enough in the West. So these guys are right about that. They're wrong about equalization. But when you say that the victimhood of the town where the 4% was exiled to Siberia, uh, many came back, many didn't, uh, is the same victimhood as 99 or 100% being butchered on the spot in 1941, that they are the same, that is nonsense. So we're into George Orwell here. Um, in June 2008, the constitution of the movement was written, the Prague Declaration. I'm just going to give a couple of excerpts here for the feel. Point 17, adjustment and overhaul of European history textbook so the children will be warned about communism the same way they're taught to assess the Nazi crime, that the textbooks have to say this. Um, then we have victimhood and then the need for a Nuremberg Tribunal type thing. Um, one of the most uh, immediate demands was for August 23rd to become a Remembrance Day equally for victims of Nazi and Soviet crime. And in 2009, the European Parliament passed a non-binding uh, uh, re resolution, in other words, that not legally enforceable, but powerful, a resolution accepting this point in the Prague Declaration. I'm very sorry to say that the United States and Canada, among other Western countries, have issued little known proclamations from the American Congress and the Canadian Parliament um, recognizing and adopting um, Black Ribbon Day, it's called. And of course, it sounds very innocent, Black Ribbon Day. Of course, we want to remember the victims of Nazism and communism. Between the lines is the project to replace Holocaust, International Holocaust Memorial Day, not least because International Holocaust Memorial Day in January commemorates the day that Soviet forces liberated Auschwitz, but that's uh, perhaps for another day. So Eastern Europe is full of what I call double genocide museums. Here are the then presidents of Germany and Estonia in Tallinn to this famous sculpture that is 
in our website, on our, in our web journal, Defending History, you'll find a whole section, Iconography and Symbology, how putting the red uh, Soviet and Nazi symbol in parallel is the visual uh, encompassing of double genocide. This is in the famous House of Terror Museum in Budapest, Hungary, where the fascist symbol is conveniently the local group rather than the Slavs. But the queen of all genocide museums is in Vilnius. They recently changed the name after our campaign to the Museum of Heroic Fights and Occupation. The Heroic Fights is the one I told you about, 1941. But it's still called the Genocide Museum popularly. In the hallway, you'll find this complicated chart, which ends up telling you that Lithuania lost 200,000 Jews to genocide and 200,000 Lithuanians to Soviet genocide. In other words, by taking the total number of victims of Soviet crime from 1940-41 and then 1944-1991 to and then adding everything together, people persecuted for their ideas, people sent to prison, um, you, will, you can come up with the number 200,000 and say everything is equal. But in other rooms, you usually have temporary exhibitions making clear which genocide was the serious one. This is an exhibition about Ukraine. In Auschwitz, we were given some spinach and a little bread. War is terrible, but famine is even worse. In other words, the Ukrainian famine was worse than Auschwitz, and the sign is telling you that, not given. And this is the lady who's remembering it. Um, now, one of the problems for double genocide was the meaning of the word genocide, even with all the debates. It was coined, of course, by Rafael Lemkin, um, the Galician Polish uh, Jewish uh, lawyer, author, thinker, legal thinker, uh, in the introduction to his famous uh, book on the Axis uh, in 1944. Axis rule, and in, in his introduction, dated late 1943, he defined genocide as destruction of a group, in other words, genocide of, of, by his own definition. But in the following pages, he himself begins to, begins to talk about mental destruction, partial destruction, prevention of birth. There's plenty in the subsequent pages that can be taken by those who would inflate or minimize the concept. So please, if you ever coin a new word and define it, define it, put a full stop, a period, and that's it. Don't go on to everything else it might mean. But leaving that aside, the word genocide in any of its definitions did not encompass being sent to prison wrongfully for your beliefs. For example, by the Soviets for, uh, for disagreeing with the regime. In Lithuania in 1992, in Estonia in 1994, and in Latvia in 1998, and in other countries in, to a lesser degree, but still, still prominently, redefine genocide by law to include such Soviet crimes as deportation and the elimination of political and social classes as equivalent to the elimination of ethnic, racial, and religious groups. For, so for example, if the Soviet Union wanted to get rid of the class of clerics, priests, and rabbis, it didn't go out and murder them and their, their families. It, uh, it, it did run a campaign to, to um, get rid of those classes, banning education, imprisonment, deportation, lack of freedom, unfair uh, criminal punishment, including capital punishment. All these crimes are not genocide. If you want proof, the population of Lithuania grew during the period of Soviet occupation and misrule. The Soviets committed horrible crimes against Lithuania, but genocide ain't one. Okay. Um, then comes corollary two of the double genocide movement, the glorification of local collaborators as anti-Soviet heroes. They were all anti-Soviet, as we said. 
Um, in 2012, Lithuania reburied with full honors the head of the Nazi puppet government of 1941, um, Brazavich Brazaitis, who personally countersigned papers uh, for Jews being sent to the seventh fort, a place where they were butchered. And then for all the Jews of his own city, Kaunas, to be incarcerated in the ghetto within a month. Okay, so I don't know, at the very best, this could be, what would be the analogy? Um, the Petar regime in Vichy, France, and now making a huge ceremony with state money. A report, reporters from the New York Times and other papers actually um, wanted to cover this story and they were dissuaded either by Lithuanian or by American authorities not to write about something that would be embarrassing. So it did make the, the Jewish press, but it did not get into the, the major media. Each year on Independence Day, there are nationalist parades and um, this poster is a feature of almost all of them. We know who our heroes are, our national heroes are. Um, all six of these guys collaborated with Hitler. Five of the six were involved with the Holocaust. So this is interesting. These are not skinheads with, with brandishing swastikas, although there are plenty of them too. These are people of high education um, who are part of this revision of history movement. So what are the motives? I mean, I think after 21 years and having very many dear, close Lithuanian friends, including many I disagree with, I think I feel what it is there. But some, nationalism is a desire for an unblemished history. We all want that. But heck, there ain't no country on earth that has an unblemished history. Second, and perhaps more sinister, Nationalism is a desire for homogeneous ethnic nationhood. Back in Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and Western Ukraine, parts of Poland and elsewhere, there are nationalists who are quietly and not so quietly happily, that happy that their regions are now close to ethnic purity and their language is the only language, the only main. Then they're very happy to have a couple of visitors, especially uh, elite visitors. In other words, this homogeneity being something to celebrate. Third, racism and anti-Semitism, a topic for another day, but I do want to make one comment. Anti-Semitism is a very multifarious uh, phenomenon. Here's the kind of anti-Semitism I've come across in my 21 years of living in Vilna. David, we love you. We love American Jews. We love South African Jews. We love Australian Jews. We love Israelis. We support Israel against all those terrible Arabs wanting to destroy Israel. We hate the local Jews or whatever's left of them for a simple reason. They're not patriotic. They think that our, our heroes murdered their families and that the Russians, the, the Soviets, are responsible for them being alive whether it's the survivors or their children, grandchildren, project. Fascinating. An anti-Semitism against East European Jews only. East European Jews, whatever they say, know from their families exactly what happened. And four, I began to allude to it, the new Cold War. The Western countries need ammunition against Putin. So that part of World War II history of the, the Grand Alliance of Great Britain, the United States, indeed Australia, and the Soviet Union and others, is something to be celebrated bringing down Hitler uh, as one of the great accomplishments of Western civilization. That doesn't fit in to this narrative and is written out. Um, there is the anti-Semitism that then goes on to blame the local Jews. Ah, they were local, they were all KGB, they were disloyal, the Jewish communists were the real mass murderers, and so forth. I mentioned the relevance to the new Cold War, and I can come back to it in questions. Um, now, I'm going to skip a little bit because we're behind. Uh, 
there are many institutions, museums and, and public history parks in, in Eastern Europe that pursue this narrative in different degrees. One of the most fascinating is Gruto Parkas or the Lenin Park. This is the park to which the statues of Lenin and other Soviet leaders, hated by the locals, were removed outside Ruskinik, and it's a wonderful amusement park for children. But the historic plaques all over the place are provided by the state-sponsored genocide center that with taxpayer money is the backbone of the entire movement. So, for example, whenever there's a bad guy who's a, a communist um, and the name is not Bernstein or Goldberg or Cohen, the name here is Charnas. So the sign tells you, our Charnas was born in Kaunas, nationality Jewish, and then etc. etc. It's crime. Um, stepping back to the 90s, I think that many Jewish organizations around the world made a mistake when they pressured Eastern European countries to come out with the truth about the Holocaust at the national level at a time when they had wonderful individuals, NGOs, who were pursuing the truth. Here is Linas Viljunas, who developed an incredibly powerful and honest educational center. He did something brilliant. He got Lithuanian kids in schools to talk to their own grandparents. And guess what? The kids found out what happened. And he published the best essays and books. This is Professor Judas Pruska, a totally humorless Captain Friday type guy. Just the facts. And he changed his mind completely when he saw the truth in the document. So these people should have been supported, but they weren't. The three Baltic states came up with red-brown commissions. I'll tell you the name of just the Lithuanian one, if I can still do it. The International Commission for the Evaluation of the Crimes of the Nazi and Soviet Occupational Regimes in Lithuania, right out of Orwell. Um, so these commissions do a lot of good work in straight Holocaust studies, who, how, who, who the Jews were in this town, what famous Jews there were. Um, and the same commission that is taking care of Holocaust studies is also the driving intellectual and political force in the European Parliament and with the American, British, Israeli governments for fixing the history. So Holocaust studies has been violated. It's been taken over. And it pains me that on so many occasions, Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum uh, in Washington, among other major institutions, um, has um, has gone along. On occasion, even the Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles has gone along on occasion, uh, not to be confused with Ephraim Zorov in the Israel office that has been at the vanguard of, of protest. Um, okay, then the next stage in all this, if we want to have total symmetry, we have this Ephraim Zorov running around for 30 years in Eastern Europe looking for war criminals to put on trial. Let's find Jewish war criminals. So who would the Jewish war criminals be in a country where 96% of the Jews were murdered? They would be the tiny number of escapees from the Vilna ghetto and other ghettos who joined up with the Soviet partisans in the forest. Our partisan heroes, anti-Nazi partisans, heroes of the free world, and indeed the only local force seriously fighting the Nazis between 1941 and 1944. And that is what actually had brought um, uh, me into it, not initially. Initially, it was in 2006 when the newspaper Res Publica began to accuse Yitzhak Arad, the former head of Yad Vashem, and indeed a member of the Lithuanian International Commission of war crimes because uh, his unit captured some German guy and killed him. Everybody knew that the partisans had no courts and judges in the forest. This was simply an ugly attempt to abuse the power of the state to defame the Jewish partisans. 
They took the evidence from Arad's own book. The whole thing is a sick joke. It's his 1975 book, The Partisan. I personally became involved in this the first time in my life in 2008 when two of my own dearest friends were accused of being war criminals. Uh, Fania Brantsovsky, who was born in 1922, so you can figure out her age. Uh, uh, she escaped the Vilna ghetto on its very last day, September 23rd, 1943. She had been the librarian of our Vilna Yiddish Institute that I had co-founded, and I invited her to come be the librarian. After these events, of course, uh, I was dismissed, and the Institute continued as for some years as a government PR unit, but th that was closed down, too, several years ago. In any case, this is Fania at the Jewish Partisan Fort, what's left of it, where 100 Jewish escapees of the Vilna Ghetto lived underground, literally, in the winter of 1943-1944 during their fight as part of the coordinated Soviet partisans against the Nazis. If anyone listening is interested in the preservation of Jewish historic sites, I would ask you, I would beg you, to stick not only to plaques and statues and other events that bring photo ops, honors, medals, and newspaper coverage, but to this site that the government wants to sink into the ground and to disappear forever. Okay, so um, the Jewish partisan fort is a cause and a number of people are working on it if anyone is interested. In fact, the cause today is being led by the former Irish ambassador to Lithuania, Donald Denham, who in 2008 stood up for Fania and uh, made a banquet in her honor. So he did something great and he's doing something great again now in his retirement. I wish there were some Jewish diplomats of whatever background who would be joining. Uh, Rojo Margolis, who passed away in 2015, had been born in 1921. And uh, she was a beloved uh, co uh, worker in the Jewish Museum, a doctor of biology and chemistry, I think now written out of the history of uh, Vilnius University. In addition to uh, being a, a partisan, in the 90s, she made the sensational rediscovery of the long lost Polish diary um, of Sarkovich, who had witnessed the murders at Ponad the mass murder site outside Vilna. Okay, so that was when I got involved on the 5th of May when two armed plainclothes police came looking for them. Um, okay, I'm now going to shift to another corollary and one that I also mentioned in brief. I mentioned that these are real democracies with a pendulum of parties and leaders where you can say and have newspapers of all different opinions, except on this issue. Hungary in 2010, Lithuania 2010, Estonia 2012, Latvia 2014, and Ukraine 2015 passed laws criminalizing failure to accept double and equal genocide. To give you an example, each law is different, and there are many legal complications. I not even details I'm not able to get into today, but let me try for numbers one, two, four, and five at least. Nobody really understands number three. The Estonian law has come to be known as the Valentine's Day law because it was passed on Valentine's Day 2012. In the other uh, four countries, the law says the law would hold me liable for these years of prison, three, two, five, or 10, if I say, write, publish, disseminate the following, I believe, and I do, that Soviet crimes were awful, they were terrible, they should be exposed and written about, and the West should be educated about. I do not believe that in these countries they ever rose to genocide or that Soviet crimes are equal remotely to the Holocaust, to Nazi crimes, and that the Nazi genocide is the only one in these countries to have taken place in the, in, the, in the war year. So if I say that, I can be liable for three years of prison in 
Hungary two years in Lithuania. Nobody has been sent to prison directly uh, for saying that. As usual, the victims are carefully chosen. Uh, someone uh, has been in prison for saying something else about the Soviet Union in Lithuania. But let me put it this way. No talented, young, open-minded person is going to be interested in even examining the different opinions in this environment. You think you'll ever be hired by a university publishing house, newspaper, or whatever, if you violate the most basic and sacred prohibitions of a state that's otherwise democratic. That makes it a lot then this campaign went beyond the borders of Eastern Europe. That's my dear late friend, Joe Malamed, the head of the Association of Lithuanian Jews in Israel, himself a prominent lawyer and former Israeli diplomat. In 2011, Interpol agents turned up at his office uh, in Tel Aviv with a writ from the... Lithu Hello? Yeah. With a writ from the Lithuanian authorities um, saying that he's wanted for questioning for defaming Lithuanian heroes. In his 1999 book, Crime and Punishment, he has lists of killers in the regions across Lithuania. Uh, before he published the book, he sent the list to prosecutors in Vilnius asking for help in investigating people who were still alive and concerning whom there were still witnesses. Of course, he never got a reply. And um, indeed, um, th this made it into uh, some international media. It was so shocking. And it was this that got the British Parliament uh, to issue a statement. Um, two years earlier, the Israeli foreign ministry was persuaded by the Lithuanian foreign ministry to get Joe Malama to take his list off the internet. So we see how difficult it was to be fighting um, also your own, your, your own country that you love over one issue. I'd like to pay tribute to the longtime head of the one honest little exhibit museum on the Holocaust in Lithuania, Rachel Kostanyan, Rochel Kostanyan. She's now retired in Berlin, and I hope that, that she will be uh, invited to share her thoughts, ideas, and memories on these issues. Um, she is not on any of the embassy or other lists, of course, for having been a dissident. There are many stories I can tell. Uh, we were in it together for quite a few years. I'll tell one little story. On at least two occasions, she got fired uh, for telling the truth, of course. <laughs> she had put out, um, she had allowed a dissident Lithuanian filmmaker, Salvos Virginis, who I congratulate him on his 70th birthday, this season uh, to show his film uh, at the museum. Make a long story short, we in the defending history community, we would simply alert the late Sir Martin Gilbert in London and like a white knight, he would write a polite letter to somebody very high up, the Lithuanian foreign minister or the museum director or the culture minister. And then of course the answer would come, what? Fire? Oh, no, 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 never heard of it. So um, an incredibly talented and brave person who was our teacher in Lithuania. Well, our response, I mentioned, we mobilized the Western embassies in 2008 or nine to stand up for the accused partisans. At the time, there was an incredible Israeli ambassador, Hein Ivri Apta. Here he's joining us in Tel Aviv to give honor to Rachel Margolis, second from the right in the foreground in June of 2009. She couldn't come back to Lithuania. She was afraid of being prosecuted for having been a member of the anti-Nazi partisans. So Ambassador Heinevi Apter, and that's his wife, they, um, they flew from Riga where he was based. At the time there was one embassy for uh, Lithuania and Latvia. Um, today, by and large, the Western embassies are completely silent and subjugated and won't uh, utter a word of criticism. There have been many other laws, a law saying that uh, Nazi and Soviet symbols are equally 
forbidden. Now, in 2008, when that was passed in Lithuania, it meant that veterans of the Soviet army, many of them Jewish, could no longer dress up once a year comfortably and celebrate May 9th, Victory Day. 2009 was the big year of export. The European Parliament voted on that one aspect, the, the, uh, the mix and match August 23rd day. Canada and U.S. signed it, and the Americans signed the OSCE Vilnius Declaration that had just one point stuck in. We condemn Nazi and Soviet genocide. The point has nothing to do with anything else. In the declaration, it stuck in there. And there was, of course, the change in Western geopolitical policy after Putin's increasing military involvement and in mischief in Georgia and then in Ukraine. The local tools are defamation. That's very much Soviet in method, nationalist in content. If someone disagrees, they're mentally ill, they're no longer the person they were, they need help, or they're a Soviet agent, or they're being paid by the Russians without even knowing it, and disemployment. This is our uh, Defending History star, one of our star writers, Evaldas Balchuna, uh, who in 2012 started publishing in English translations of his articles, all of which had the following theme. Why does our country honor murderers? Why are there street names for Noreika and, and for all these other Murderers. So in Defending History, you can see a section. It wasn't long before police started um, visiting him at his place of work. Then he no longer had a place of work. And for years and years, he was schlepped into Vilna. He lived in Shavu, Shaole, hundreds of kilometers away, uh, for a kangaroo hearings that were just harassment. I'm very proud that my buddies and me came to all of them to show moral support, but not a single foreign Holocaust organization or professor or embassy would take any uh, interest. Indeed, in 2009, we founded DefendingHistory.com, the web journal, and then came the Battle of the Declarations, the 70 Years Declaration that we did in the European Parliament is the brainchild of Danny Ben Moshe, who, as was mentioned earlier, is the Australian, though London-born, filmmaker and scholar and wonderful guy um, who made the film Revising uh, History in, in 2012 about all this up to that year. Now, uh, Danny and I decided, like two nice Jewish boys, how do you answer a declaration? You make another declaration. So we made our declaration. And those who know both of us understand that Danny was the brains behind the practical side, which was getting us to the European Parliament so we would get signatures. Guess what? In a couple of days, we got 70 signatures for our declaration. Um, I'll never forget one of the vice presidents of the European Parliament said to me when he signed, he says, oh, Dover, this is embarrassing. A few years ago, I signed the other one or one of their it sounded so good, equal evaluation, equal victims. They had a young Jewish member of parliament who came and wept. And then I said, no, we all grow. We all, we, we all constantly revise our, uh, our views. Well, in speaking to Americans, British, and others in the State Department, in the Foreign Office in Britain, uh, in various embassies, and as a result of friendships with diplomats over many years, one sentence that keeps coming, that I keep hearing again and again is, look, the um, Eastern Europeans are the only ones who will ever fight the Russians. America, Britain, France, and Germany will not sacrifice young men and women to fight the Russians when the day comes. In return for this, all they want is, you know, to fix a little bit of history here and there. Ah, nobody's getting killed. Let it go. Uh, that has been the, not in those words, but some, not in those words formally, but very much in those words informally. Um, in Israel, there's been the attitude that we need the votes. Israel does indeed need votes in the EU, UN, and UNESCO. 
And on numerous occasions, there have even been direct quid quo quos where, for example, um, in one of the stories, the Lithuanians wanted Yad Vashem to send representatives back to the state commission even after the Arad fiasco, and that was done. And in return, uh, Israel got a vote against the Palestinians joining UNESCO. That was 2000. There are all kinds. Uh, this needs uh, a new coterie of historians and writers who will research all this. And in the midst of all that, the heroic Ken Ivri Apta, who tragically died young of cancer, that Israeli ambassador will not be forgotten. And then when it comes to the increasing number of Jewish people seeking their roots, in Eastern Europe, a perfectly healthy, normal, wonderful thing that we can do now that we couldn't in the Soviet time. There has been a campaign in many countries, again, I bring my first example from Lithuania, where visitors get honors, free trips, medals, grants, in return for acquiescing with Holocaust revisionism or something milder just legitimizing it by way of joining bodies and participating and remaining silent on those things. Um, there's a whole industry of EU passports by people who have ancestry in these countries. And let me be very quick to say, I think there's nothing wrong with getting a Lithuanian or Latvian or Estonian or Polish passport if um, someone's ancestors come from there. That's wonderful. The problem is, when passport applications are fast tracked or given special privileges in return um, for supporting Holocaust revisionism. This happened dramatically on numerous occasions with big wigs from South Africa and from the South African community in Israel. Uh, it happened um, with a series of articles. It happened with um, honoring a Lithuanian foreign minister after he made the notorious Hitler-Stalin comparison about length of mustache and anti-Semitic remarks. And at the same time, South Africa is also home to some of our staunchest allies. Um, so this isn't a commentary on the place, but it's a phenomenon. In recent years, Grant Goetsch and a South African-born uh, businessman, financial advisor in California, many of whose family were killed by under the authority of the Holocaust perpetrator Jonas Noreika actually went to court in Vilnius over there being a huge plaque in central Vilnius honoring Noreika. This became a huge story in recent years. A, um, a dissident politician smashed the plaque and then the nationalists put up a bigger one. Before that, the mayor took down the reconstituted smashed plaque and now there's a better plaque standing, but the issue continues in court. The Konyukovsky collection has been published in English, I think, by an Australian publisher, which is very important because these are all testimonies of what happened in every town starting June 22nd, 23rd. Then there's the important new book by Ruta Vanagaita and Ephraim Zurich, translated into multiple languages. And Vanagaita is to be commended for her courage. She too came from an opposite opinion years before. And when. I'm going to finish with issues that are on the table today on the eve of 2021. As I mentioned, the Lithuanian parliament has named 2021 for an activist in the 1941 uh, LAF, Lithuanian Activist Front, against whom there is testimony that he participated in the Kaunas Garage massacre and the beheading of Rabbi Zalman of Sofsky, uh, whose head was put in the, the shop of the beneath. Now, I am not asking anyone to say that this man is a proven war criminal. Without a trial, we can't do that. I'm not asking anyone to condemn, God forbid, Lithuania or its parliament. I am asking Holocaust scholars, politicians, Jewish leaders, to politely say to the Lithuanian parliament, this isn't good for your country, this is wrong. Your country has enough incredible heroes from the Middle Ages all the way up 
to the rescuers who the, the righteous of the Gentiles who risked everything to save a nation. Then there's the, sa the saga of the Noreka plaque that I just mentioned. There's a bigger and better plaque plus a marble slab um, outside the Genocide Museum there on the Lake Street. There's a huge controversy uh, over the fate of the old Jewish cemetery in Vilna. This is a Holocaust issue because if there had been no Holocaust, the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people buried there would have had descendants to stand up for their graves. So um, the current plan is to house a new national convention center in the heart of the cemetery. Now it still is a cemetery because many thousands of people are still buried there. In Jewish law, it would be a cemetery even had they been moved. But the gravestones were all pilfered by the soldiers. In any case, this is going on. Um, okay. Re now, I mentioned before the 70 years declaration, Danny Ben Moshe's and our declaration actually succeeded in putting a temporary stop to the European Union legislating on double genocide. To put it in everyday language, they saw that it's not as simple as they were told, that this is a universal thing, equal, 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 that there's a problem here, that there's a far right that wants to glorify Nazi collaborators, etc., etc. And things were quiet for almost a decade, but it, it had restarted last year. Uh, in September 2019, suddenly, there was a new resolution on European remembrance. And point number three is recognizing Nazi and Soviet genocide. Two holocausts, if you will. Then there is the question of the definition of genocide. And this has come up in two famous cases, more actually. And I can't go into the ins and outs here, but let me give you the outline. Lithuanian prosecutors prosecuted elderly Lithuanian people who had been members of the KGB in the 1950s and were proven to have participated in atrocities against the Forest Brothers who were captured. The Forest Brothers being the post-war, um, some people call them guerrillas, other partisans. Now, this is no simple question. The Forest Brothers were indeed fighting Soviet rule. Many, but not all of them, were recycled Holocaust killers. Most of them were sympathetic to fascism. And the book published by a very brave Lithuanian author whose career has also been ruined lists 25,000 innocent civilians they killed, people who worked in Soviet collective farms, uh, people who saved Jews, etc. There, I don't think that there are any right here, but there may well be heroes among them. In any case, these cases used the word genocide as redefined in the 1990s. So the first case was Vasilauskas versus Lithuania. The lawyers for Mr. Vasilauskas went to the European Union to appeal his conviction on genocide for having killed two um, forest brothers in the 1950s. Mind you, two members of a militia, not civilians. So the European um, Court of Human Rights, uh, its grand chamber, voted nine to eight to overturn Lithuania. And part of the legal thinking, again, it's too involved for today, part of the legal uh, reasoning is that they had applied it unfairly retroactively, that you can't take a law from the 1990s and accuse someone for having committed that crime in the 1950s. But as you see, it was nine to eight, and it was only a matter of time before um, they would find someone else. And the European court has now become a Nochschlepper with a second case in March 2019, where the European uh, Court of Human Rights by five to two upheld the Lithuanian court's decision to convict on genocide someone who had killed a member of the Forest Brothers who was the same guy that 2018 was named after and uh, Ramanauskas 
who is a le who said in his memoirs proudly that he was the leader of one of the groups of the LAF militia in June 1941. I would mention that the um, the Lithuanian embassy in Washington tried to have a big statue put up in New Britain, Connecticut, where Mr. Romanowskis was by coincidence born in 1919, but the town council rejected it after learning of his participation in Nazi militias during the Holocaust, whether or not he was ever put on trial. So here we are, that in 2019, someone is accused of genocide for having killed an alleged Holocaust perpetrator who was part of an armed militia after the war. That's how far the word genocide has come today in the European Court of Human Rights. Finally, looking ahead, Kaunas, Kovna, has been designated the capital of European culture for 2022. I am one of those and many people I know in Kaunas who are thrilled with it, but before 2022, should we not ask that Kaunas remove, replaces street names for notorious killers, like this street name for Noreika, using his nom de guerre, General Vetra. Or in the great university of Kaunas, Ritautas Magnus University, there is this uh, sculpture, bas relief, and uh, lecture hall name for Yosa Sambrazavichus, the uh, head of the, the Nazi puppet provisional government um, wh whose remains were uh, reburied and was full armored in 2012. <clears throat> it hurts us when prominent Jewish scholars come to conferences at this university and don't even comment on the offense and the need. We have an interactive map on defending history that's slowly growing of Nazi sh shrines to Nazi collaborators in Kaunas. So we're hoping for some support on that. So uh, please visit defendinghistory.com. I want to thank anonymous donors in Australia who have kept defending history going. Thank you. And I'd be delighted to do my best with any questions or discussion that, uh, that you might have. Okay, first of all, I, I thought I'd um, attempt to mirror your wonderful bookshelf there. Oh, well I, uh, done. You have outdone me by 10. <laughs> so uh, that was amazing. That was a very comprehensive um, overview of, of many years of, of the work you've been doing and the challenges that you're facing um, over there. Um, this is uh, has been quite a long lecture. Let's see um, if we have any questions. Um, so someone has asked, uh, Dr. Katz, thank you for your lecture and for pointing out the most problematic points of equalization. Sorry, there's a background noise of Nazi and Soviet crimes. What would be the difference of outcome if separate institutions, research centers, etc., existed compared to what is happening today? Are there any good practices or initiatives in any Eastern European ex-Soviet countries that could serve as examples? Right. As I perhaps tried to allude to, there have been NGOs, there have been individuals, but they have always been on the margins of the mainstream, not in the mainstream. So that little greenhouse I mentioned, that one honest bastion of Holocaust truth-telling, survived all those years thanks to Rachel Kostanyan, you know, courage. And now with her retirement in Berlin, we're all very concerned. But the short answer is not yet. And any such major institution would have many differences. I think it might, um, at this moment, make more sense to engage more with the revisionist historical work coming out of the existing institutions. But uh, the answer to the question is still yes, it would be important to have separate programs on Nazi and, and, and Soviet crime. Although for anybody studying World War II and a historian is going to study that. 
Uh, I'm not sure if there are any other questions. Um, it has been pretty comprehensive, so um, just waiting to see if anyone else. Feel has... free to disagree or to <laughs> bring on a challenge. Um, Please, yes, yes. So it is late here. I know you're you're just starting your day there, right? I have a confession to make. Everybody has their own, whatever the word is, inclination, tendency. I'm a night owl. I'm a born night owl. This is the first time in my life I've ever given a talk that started for which I had to be at the screen 8 a.m. So I'm very grateful to you for helping me break new ground. <laughs> well, uh, COVID has uh, certainly broken a lot of new ground for all of us. And... Um, yes, I understand this is a great challenge because it's probably, what, 8, 8.30, 9, 9.30 in the morning there. So, look, we really appreciate the effort you've gone to to update us on um, what's happening there. And you're navigating challenging and tricky politics um, in Vilnius and beyond, obviously, in the work you're doing. Um, and many of the accounts are, are truly shocking uh, for us to learn about but we must stay informed and, and, you know, I encourage you, obviously, I don't think you need encouragement, but uh, to continue the work you're doing and everyone has seen the defendinghistory.com website, that's where to go for more information or should you have any questions that um, you want David to answer, uh, I'm sure he would only be only too happy to share his information with you. So. Thank you for enlightening us. Thank you for enlightening us. Thank you for getting up early to do so. Thank you to everyone who's um, listened to this and participated. And uh, we look forward to catching up with you hopefully in person one day. And I, I do encourage um, everyone, um, not everyone obviously is up for a trip uh, to the Baltic region. But, uh, you know, it, I, I found it really incredible, very rewarding, um, challenging, but rewarding. So thank you, David. Thank you. Any parting words from you? Thank you so much for having me. You are one of two institutions, the other being the wonderful um, Cape Town uh, Holocaust and, and, and Genocide Center. You are the only two Holocaust centers in the world, in Melbourne and in Cape Town, that has ever invited any of us to present on this issue. So thank you. Thank you. And I also will pass on my regards from Danny Ben Moshe, who says hello. Thank you. His London friends still remember him as Dan Moss. <laughs> So thanks everyone for joining us tonight and um, we'll keep you uh, posted on any new lectures that we're planning on hosting. So thank you. Good night, everyone.